Good morning, church. The reading is from Psalm 1, 1 to 6. Blessed is the man who walks not in the, wicked, in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the wicked, the way of the wicked, will perish. Hear the word of the Lord. Good morning, everyone. If we have not met before, my name is Reino. I have the privilege of serving this church as elder. I also have the privilege of serving this church as pastor. And it is my privilege, my word, triple whammy of privileges this morning, to open up God's word with you. We are in week eight of our current sermon series called Deeper. Every single Sunday we've said that this series is about an invitation to know, read, pray, experience, reflect, grow deeper. Think about any relationship with any person you could have. There's always more to know. One can always go deeper. Now just imagine how much more one can know about God, right? The creator and the sustainer of everything and everyone. In the same way that you go deeper in a relationship with a human being, you go deeper in your relationship with God, and then you'll discover His vastness, His greatness, and His awesomeness. There was a Swiss-German theologian who said that the more you get to know God, the more you, re- uh, the more you get to know God, the more you realize that God is wholly different, wholly different than you ever imagined. Beautiful, huh? I mean, that's something that we should aspire to. Now, let's begin by taking time to be honest with ourselves as we reflect on this. Firstly, is a deeper relationship with God a reality for you? Because that's the invitation. Is it a reality for you? If I would ask you now what your relationship with God is like, what will you tell me? In the same way, let's say you ask me what my relationship with my wife is like. I'll tell you, well, I saw it just now before I left home. This is what we did over the weekend. This is what I like about her. This is what we do together. This is what happened this week between us. This is what we talk about. This is how we met, blah, blah, blah. It's all there because it's a real relationship. If you'd ask me about my relationship with my kids, I'll tell you when they were born and what they do and how they roll and what their names are and what I enjoy about them and what they actually did this week and what I laughed about this morning and what I had to discipline them about this morning. It's real. It's right there. I'm in it. Question. If I ask you what your relationship with God is like, will you be able to tell me what it's like in the same way that you'll be able to tell me about any other flesh and blood relationship you might have? When when last did you talk to him? What did you guys talk about? What did he say to you? What did you say to him? What did he teach you? What did you do together? Where did you feel his presence? Where did you not? If you're not a believer in here this morning, I want you to know that when we Christians talk about a relationship with God, we talk about something that is real. And we talk about something that is as real as any flesh and blood relationship you have and more. Because the other party, God, Yahweh, who became a human in Jesus and then sent His Spirit to us, is so much more. And He's perfect. Always loving, always gracious, always merciful, and always just a really good dad. If I was one of those singing pastors, I would have busted out in good, good father now, but I can't. Do you know what I mean? So just a question before we, before we get into it. Where are you? Where are you in terms of your relationship with God? Hold it. We're going to get back to it. Today's theme is the two ways. Now, the theme might ring a bell because Jesus himself spoke about two ways. Let me show you Matthew 7, verses 13 to 14 in the Christian Standard Bible. It says, enter through the narrow gate. 
For the gate is wide and the road broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who go through it. How narrow is the gate and difficult the road that leads to life, and few find it. The words of Jesus. So think about this. You can only be on one of the two. So which one is it? Is it the narrow one? Or is it the wide one? Are you one of the few that found the road that leads to life? So the road that leads to life needs wisdom, fam. Wisdom is knowing how to live in light of the reality of God and His Word. That's wisdom, okay? Because God exists whether you like it or not, and His Word exists whether you like it or not, and it'll keep on existing. It is imperishable. It is always alive. We need wisdom to know how to live in light of that. On the other hand, though, the road that leads to destruction needs selfishness, apathy, lust, short-sightedness, arrogance, foolishness. The list is actually really, really long about how you can get on the wide road. The list on how you get on the narrow road is really, 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 really short. Because there's many options to get to destruction and ruin. I mean, the text says it. It's wide, it's broad, and many people go down that road. So if the road that leads to life needs wisdom, how do we attain wisdom? There you go. That's our question for this morning. How do we attain wisdom? Three things. You start from the right place. You see the wicked for who they are, here today and gone tomorrow. And you know the difference. Got it? That's our map for this morning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as we open your word now, we want wisdom. And we want to know how to attain wisdom. Because we want to live in life, uh, we want to live in light of the reality that you are alive, and that your word is alive, and that you have something to say to us, each one of us, this morning. So, Lord Jesus, I pray that through your spirit, that you'll illuminate our minds, that you would give us great focus, that you'd give us an openness to your teaching, a clarity to your word, and that you transform us as this word comes into our ears and into our hearts. I pray, Lord Jesus, that your name would be glorified as I preach now, as we use communion later, and as we respond in song. We pray that in your name. Amen. Let's look at the first one. Okay, so how do we attain wisdom? You start from the right place. Look at verses 1 to 3. Lots of highlights, bold and underlined they are. Okay, so I'll be speaking about them as we go through these three verses. Firstly, the righteous, the person in this psalm, are introduced as blessed, right, or happy. Now, what I want you to see is their happy state is not something given automatically by God, but their happy state is a direct result of their activity. Do you guys see it? So blessed is the man, and then the man does something. And that something he does leads to his or her blessedness. Okay, so how is this person blessed? Well, firstly, from a negative perspective, by avoiding the advice, the lifestyle, and the assembly of wicked persons. Do you guys see it? The parallels in the first verse are all synonymous, and they describe in different ways the evil company that should be avoided by the righteous person. Do you guys see it? So, walks not, nor, nor, and then it says what this person does not do. Now, the verbs demonstrate a kind of a progression, if you want to. It can also be called a regression, right? Because first you walk, and then you stand, and then you sit. And once you sit, you're in the congregation of uh, uh, sorry, you are in the seat of scoffers, right? Because you've walked in the way of sinners and you've walked, uh, sorry, you've sat in the way of sinners and you've walked in the counsel of the wicked. So the righteous person, the blessed person in this psalm avoids all the dimensions of the way of the wicked and in that lies the source of blessedness or happiness. Do you guys see it? Okay. Let's talk about the word blessed. 
I'm going to put it on the screen for you so that we can take a good old look at it. Thank you for Unsplash for cool photos like this. Blessed means, listen, not influenced by this world. Outside of the reach of this world. That's what blessed means. In plain English, it doesn't matter where or how you are, you are blessed. Right? I know people use the hashtag, hashtag blessed. Someone says hashtag permanently blessed. Right? <laughs> Always and in all circumstances. Okay? Now, do you see where you can't be if you want to be blessed? Go back to verse 1. You cannot be in the counsel of the wicked. You cannot sit or stand in the way of sinners. And you cannot sit in the seat of scoffers. They don't go together. In the same way, Shiami said this last week, that I can't take ice cold uh, 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 blocks of ice and pour it into boiling water and believe that they'll coexist, it cannot be done. It's incompatible. Okay? So blessed is the man who is outside of the counsel of the wicked. And then this person should engage in a positive task, right? Which is identified in verse 2. Look at it with me. And that is related to God's word or God's law. Okay? So the term Torah is used in the psalm, that's the Hebrew word for the law, which mostly in the Bible speaks about the first five books of the Bible. Uh, obviously, by the time that Psalm 1 was written, there was more Bible books written. So the law points to God's word. Now, the reason why the word Torah is important is because Torah means instruction. Specifically, the instruction which God gives to mankind as a guide for life. Do you guys see it? So the blessed man does something with that law. And that is, he delights on it, and he meditates on it, and not every now and then, but constantly, day and night. So God's instruction. Oh, how beautiful it is. I can't stop consuming it. I can't stop thinking about it. Hashtag permanently blessed. Right? So firstly, where are you not? And secondly, what should you do? Now, let's talk about the word delight. And then talk about the word meditation. The word delight in Hebrew is hagar. And it's a word that is meant to, I'm now going to draw on your high school English syllabus, it's a word that's meant to be onomatopoeic, right? So it's a word that should make a sound that should remind you. So haga is an onomatopoeic word, okay? And it implies more than just thinking about it, right? There's an utterance that happens when you delight in this way. The following slide is not for sensitive viewers. Some might be upset and triggered by it. Take a look at this. Come on. A lion chowing a piece of raw meat. Do you know, if I, if I had to describe in Hebrew what this lion is doing, I would say this lion is busy hagaing the meat. Because it's the same word, right? I don't know how many of you have seen lions eat. It is an unbelievably awesome vocal experience. Because as they get in there, and as they rip the skin and the flesh, and it's blood and guts everywhere over their faces, they just can't stop growling and making this noise of delight as they tear open this flesh. Aga, 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 aga. It's unbelievable. I wasn't growling now. I was just saying a Hebrew word in quick succession. That's what it means. So the writer of this psalm says, if you want to start from the right place, you start with God's law. But the way you start with God's law is you get your teeth in it and you enjoy it. And you delight in it and you chow it. And then the word used for 
Meditation is a word used that describes murmuring and whispering and continuously uttering something. In the Bible, the sound that a pigeon makes or a dove makes is the same word that's used for what you should do with God's law. Right? I'm not proposing that you walk around that you go... That's not what I'm proposing. But what the psalmist says is the person who delights in the law has it in his mouth the whole day. And he's whispering it under his breath and he's murmuring it and thinking about it and uttering it. It's not only in here, fam. It has to go down here by chowing it into here. And then you have to carry it with you. Who's hungry? Yeah, I feel you. I feel you. So, the wisdom of this psalm says that the righteous find delight in God's law by constant meditation. Okay? Now, think about this. We are reading something that tells us about the creator, the creator and the sustainer of everyone and everything. Do you know how much there is to learn? I mean, just think about browsing for a minute. Or doing research or learning something new you click and then you click again and then you click again and then you read a bit and then you click again and then you go okay wait I have to go back to this thing now because it seems like all of this fits together but I have to make a clipping here and I just have to save that but I also want to search about that and then you go deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. It's the same with research. It's the same with learning something. Do you know the Bible works like that as well, fam? It's not like you open it up, you read two verses, and you go, boom, done for the day, Instagram. <laughs> Let me get some reels going here. That's not how it works. Like, as you read the Bible and as you chow it, you click and you click and you click again. Who is this person? Where does this come from? What does this thing mean? What does it mean for me? Is this the first time I see something like this? Or was there a previous uh, uh, story that I had this in? This story reminds me about that story. So I have to go back to that one and then see how that links. Is this verse about Jesus or is it not? Well, let me go and see. That's the way we study the Bible. And in terms of resources to study the Bible, we are really spoiled, fam. We've got the Bible app, we've got books, we've got video sharing channels, we've got podcasts, we've got the interwebs. There's always something to learn. Yesterday morning, I was under the impression that I have read every single reading plan on version that the Bible Project set up. And I was like, ooh, let me see if they put out some new ones. Bible Project... 25 new plans. And I'm like, yes, this is so good. Prioritize them from 100 days to 6 days to 3 days to 5 days. I've got a whole reading plan for the next month. It's going to be awesome. Like, I can't wait. And fam, I've read this book many times. But I can't wait to read it again because it's going to be awesome. Because I'm going to learn more and more and more. Question, this is a real question. Do you read your Bible? Do you read your Bible? The happiness of the righteous person, or the blessed state of the righteous person, in verse 3, uh, is illuminated by a comparison to a tree, right? Now a tree may flourish or fade, depending on its location and its access to water. Obviously, if you take a tree from a dry spot, and then you put it next to a spot that's well irrigated, inevitably it will flourish, it will become green, and will be fruitful. Do you see that the state of blessedness or happiness is not a reward? Do you see it? It is rather the result of a particular way of life, a type of life. Where this life starts makes all the difference. The tree next to the water will always flourish and will always bear fruit. You start there. Do you see it? And in the same way, for us, if we want wisdom then we should see that starting by delighting in God's word and meditating on a day and night is the place where we need to start. Outside of the council and the, um, uh, the community of the wicked. So the prosperity of this person in Psalm 1 
reflects the wisdom of a life lived according to the plan of the giver of all life. Now, just a quick note. Do you know that this tree can experience adverse weather? Do you know that the elements might sometimes batter this tree? And do you know that in the end the tree will flourish again because the tree is planted in the right place? Do you see it? Come on, fam. I'm not saying that everything will always be awesome, but I'm saying if your roots is in the right place, you will always flourish. And you will always bear fruit. Amen. Sometimes from the outside, things might batter down on you, but not from the inside because your roots are firm. Let me just take a moment here to remind you that Jesus came because He wants this for you. Jesus didn't come because He wants something from you. Do you know that? Jesus came because He wants something for you, and He said, I am the narrow gate through which you will get life, and this life in this psalm is described as abundance. As flourishing, as fruitful, as free, right? Away from all the knots we read in verse 1. This is a life that prospers. This is what Jesus wants for us. And that's why He came. So that we can intimately know Him. And while we intimately know Him, we are declared to be righteous. I intentionally use the word righteous up until now to remind you that you can be called righteous because Jesus gave His righteousness to you through faith. That's what we'll celebrate in just a few minutes' time. There's no barrier between God and us. We have direct access to Him. We can know Him. The Bible says, and we've quoted this a zillion times, by grace, through faith, we can have this life. We can be like this tree. We confess it, we believe it, faith is a gift, and we grip it by taking a leap. That's how it works. And once we're saved, and once we understand what Jesus is calling us into, then we get to read the Bible. Right? Then we don't say we must read the Bible. I've said this a thousand times, but I'm going to say it again. If I walk up to my wife and I tell her, listen, I must tell you that I love you, and I must kiss you, therefore... I love you, give me a kiss. What do you think our marriage is going to be like? It's not going to work. Rather, I walk up to her, all my kids, I mean, I can use any of them, and go, I can't believe that I have the privilege of either being your husband or being your father. I get to kiss you. Bring those cheeks. Fam, the other day my grade two daughter said to me at school, Dad, I would prefer it if you would not eat my cheeks anymore in front of everyone. <laughs> I had a hard week, fam. I had a hard week because I was hugging on those cheeks. But she has now grown up. It happened so fast. I asked you earlier, where are you? Where are you? So I'm going to ask that to you again. Because I want you to know that you can have this. You can be like a tree planted yielding and never withering. That will satisfy you. That will fulfill you. Nothing else. So how do we attain wisdom? We start from the right place. Secondly, we see the wicked for who they are. Here today and gone tomorrow. Look at verse 4. Brilliant statement. Not so the wicked. They shall not prosper like the righteous. The life of the wicked is summarized in this really brief comparison in verse 4. It says the wicked are like chaff. Now this language reflects the practice of winnowing grain at harvest time, right? So what would happen is the grain would be tossed into the air with a pitchfork at the village threshing floor, and then the wind would separate the light chaff, right, blown away, um, and the more substantial grain fell back to the floor, right? Weighty, lightweight. Do you guys see it? So chaff is something that is light, and that is useless, and that is part of the crop, but it's disposed by the farmer. The wicked 
are like chaff. They are depicted in this uh, psalm as lightweights. Pers uh, people without real substance or worth. And then it says in verse 5, well, it, verse 5 then describes this lightness of the wicked. Look at the two lines in verse 5. It says the wicked hold no weight or influence in the important areas of human society. Do you guys see it? Where the righteous meet for the pursuit of justice and government, the wicked have no place and are not recognized. They live for themselves. They cannot participate in the affairs of those who live for others and for righteousness. It's a weird world we live in now, isn't it? Because where we are, the wicked is counted as lightweight. Here today, gone tomorrow. So see the wicked for who they are. Because here where we serve a different Lord, right? The Lord Jesus. We obey Him and we obey Him alone. We seek His kingdom. Shiami landed with that last week. And we trust Him for everything else. In this place, the wicked does not have a standing. So why do we care so much about wicked people? hurting other people, pretending as if they make the law according to which we should live. We live according to a different law, which is the law of the Bible. How do we attain wisdom? We start from the right place. Second point, we see the wicked for who they are here today and gone tomorrow. Let's land with this one. How do we attain wisdom? We know the difference. We know the difference. So look at verse 6. Verse 6 says, in the last resort, human beings are of two kinds, either righteous or wicked. The two ways, right, that I spoke about earlier. They may be righteous, and if they are, God protects their way. Do you see it? Do you see it? So if you are on the narrow road, through the narrow gate, living life according to this book, God has got you. There's really nothing to worry about. And He will lead you. Faithfully. Every single day and in everything. If you're not righteous, you're wicked. And for the wicked, their final destiny is doom. And the doom of the wicked, as it's written in this psalm, is not a punishment any more than the happiness of the righteous is a reward. Do you see it? It is a natural outcome of a way of life which has been chosen. Do you see the choice? That's why I started with Jesus' words in Matthew 7. You have to choose. And it's either or. There is no middle ground. If you choose the way of the righteous, the way of delighting and meditating, the way of salvation, there you go. That's your result. The Lord will know your way and He will protect your way. It's not a reward, it's a result. And if you choose not to, to ignore this book or to pretend like it's a news headline that you just have to dabble in every now and then and you perish, you shouldn't be surprised. Because that's the natural result, the natural outcome for that way of life. I said my third point is know the difference. Okay, I'm going to show you a funny meme. <laughs> for some reason, know the difference memes for me is unbelievably funny. Okay, This is Twilight Sparkle. This is also Twilight Sparkle. <laughs> know the difference. <laughs> Do you guys see it? It's really, really, really important that we know the difference. Okay? It is a lie, check, that truth is relative. Truth isn't relative. We should know the difference between truth and untruth or lies. It is a lie that all religions are the same. It's not. 
We should know the difference between our Christian confession and other faiths. It is a lie that all humans adhere to the same set of values just a little bit differently expressed. It is a lie. We should know the difference when we hear these things. Look at what C.S. Lewis says. Is there a C.S. Lewis uh, quote on there? No? C.S. Lewis says, Once people stop believing in God, the problem is not that they will believe in nothing. Rather, the problem is that they will believe in anything. I'm going to read that again. Once people stop believing in God, the problem is not that they will believe in nothing. Rather, the problem is that they will believe anything. So we should know the difference. Because knowing the difference is wisdom. So how do we know the difference between these two ways? We know it by God's Word. By delighting in it. By meditating on it. Here's a stern, loving, pastoral truthful warning to you. If you don't find delight in this book and you don't meditate on it, you might not be able to know the difference. You might not be able to know the difference. And you might be on the path that's headed to doom and destruction, even though you might think you're on the narrow path that leads to life. This is very, very important. And we have all the resources in the world to study this book. We don't know anything about this man of who the psalm speaks, right? What we do know is that this man is not known for the things that people in our culture are known, right? This man is known as one who fears and has reverence for God in his daily life. This is a man who avoids evil and learns how to live from God's law. And therein lies his wisdom. So how do we attain wisdom? We start from the right place. We see the wicked for who they are here today and gone tomorrow. And we know the difference. Amen. Amen.